I'm Lucy. And I'm Jennifer. You're listening to Everything I Know About. Each week, we share everything we know about a new topic, equipped with some internet research and a little too much exposure to pop culture. Hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. So we have a very fun episode this week. I have been seeing so much mukbang content on TikTok, and it got me interested in what the origins of mukbangs were, why people like it so much. I was honestly just confused at first because it's kind of is content that I don't love watching, but I am forced to watch it because the algo just loves to feed it to me. And so I think that means you do like watching it because the algo knows that you're clearly spending a lot of time on those videos. It's like a rage bait watch for sure. <laughs> like I'm watching it like, what is this? So we are going into the history, the culture, the implications of mukbanging. We also have some fun bonus content that we just recorded that will be up on our Patreon for any subscribers to the Patreon. We did a little mukbang ourselves. I tried out crumble cookie for the first time and Lucy. And I did Wingstop for the first time, which these are like viral mukbang foods for those who aren't as familiar. You can see our honest, true <laughs> reactions to our crumble and Wingstop bites uh, if you want to go over on the Patreon and subscribe. But we will be posting more and more bonus content over there, full bonus episodes, and also the book club. Amazing. Now that we're both extremely full and, I mean, a little buzzed, I've had half a beer with my Wingstop. Lucy shows up with her wings and a beard, and I'm like, well, now I have to, too, so I have a white claw with me. <laughs> Our first buzzed pod. Honestly, I feel kind of gross. I think I just ate 2,000 calories. I'm so thirsty. I feel gross, but I'm going to drink this white claw, and I'll feel better. How are you feeling? I'm good. Well, okay, I feel like we didn't do the official mukbang route, because I do think it definitely involves ordering and eating excessive amounts of food. I feel like we ordered normal amounts of food. I mean, four cookies, I guess, is a lot. I did not eat all four cookies to be clear. Uh, sure. <laughs> but yeah, so I feel okay. I feel like if I had actually done a full-on mukbang, I would be like lying on the couch right now with my food baby in pain, which oh, yeah. is normally how I end up after eating at a restaurant because I have so little self-control, but I feel okay right now. You know what? I wish I could do this kind of content because after seeing how much these mukbangers make, I don't know. It'd be kind of fun to do it. I mean, maybe our bonus content and TikTok clips are going to take off and they'll be like demand for Jennifer. All right. So the shape of our conversation today, Lucy's going to take us into the Asian origins of the mukbang all the way through up until about 2015 when mukbangs enter the Western market and it becomes a much different kind of content than it was in Asia. And at the end, we're going to chat about why people love mukbangs, the sort of like social implications of it, and some of the research we found on how it's affecting us and our mental health. So Lucy, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I would love to. Sorry, hold on. I'm like choking. <laughs> I was like burping and choking on it. <laughs> Issues of eating right before you record a podcast. Okay, so mukbang is a combination of two Korean words that essentially mean eating and broadcast. It started in 2011 in Korea as this burgeoning phenomena, and people think that the origins of it are basically because more and more people started living alone and eating their meals alone and feeling lonely or like lacking a sense of community, since it is a big part of Korean culture to like eat food with your colleagues or like have these kind of larger group meals. So mukbangers, also known as BJs in Korea, which stands for broadcast jockeys, they basically record themselves eating large quantities of food. The food is often Korean food, but also includes fried chicken, like American snack foods, and they live stream. So what I'm more familiar with is when people post on YouTube, which is not a live stream, but this was exclusively live streaming. So it'd be like you sitting down for an hour, tuning in to your favorite mukbanger, and literally at the same time that they're eating, you can message them and you can also send them tips this sounds like TikTok Live or Twitch. Yeah, exactly. So the platform that this is all hosted on is called Africa TV, which is a Korean-specific live streaming platform. Interesting name. <laughs> yeah, it's spelled like A-F-R-E-E-C-A, -E -E which is a combination of the words A free broadcasting. That was like a purely Korean website. It was only Korean language being spoken on it. By around 2014, the popularity of this started growing so much that even Korean mukbangers started posting on YouTube and like using Twitch. So it kind of started on this Africa TV platform in Korea and then expanded beyond that. So these BJs, just to give you a sense for like what they were making money-wise, 
and how the system worked when it was still localized to Korea. They were making most of their money through fan gifts. So it's not like on YouTube where you like make money through advertising or like sponsors. This is like purely your fans paying for you to like continue doing this work. Mm. And they would send these star balloons and each balloon is worth 10 US cents. The more successful ones, they had so many fans sending them these balloons that like there's one example of this really popular BJ named Park Seyoon who goes by the diva and she was making 9,000 US dollars per month. Oh. off of fan donations. Uh-huh. Wow. This was nine years ago, but she was 34 at the time, and she had 322,000 subscribers and 13,000 broadcast hours. Wow. Good for her. Yeah. And I looked at some, like, documentary type thing that Munchies did where they sent a reporter to Korea, and, like, she interviewed a bunch of BJs and then also some of the fans to try to understand what the hype was. And... Since I looked at the history of all this stuff, all of the articles and, like, content I was referencing was, like, nine years old. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really interesting because now I feel like everybody understands mukbang and, like, what it is. But it was interesting to, like, watch this reporter be like, this is so strange. I've never seen this behavior before. Yeah. Like, yeah. She was British, but the, the documentary I watched had suspenseful dark music. Like, I, I felt like they were kind of thinking it was maybe this dirty underground thing. Yeah, sort of like this shameful, bizarre yeah. thing that's going on over there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which is hilarious because even though the specific live broadcasting of your eating, like the mukbang originated in Korea, competitive eating and like our obsession with food is very much an American thing. Yeah. And I immediately thought about like Super Size Me even, which, yes, the larger message was he was trying to like show how McDonald's is unhealthy and bring more awareness to the corporations driving obesity in American culture. But also, like, you know, he ate McDonald's three meals a day every single day. And, like, part of the allure of watching that documentary was, like, watching him eat. And that was in 2004 in America. And there was also, like, Man vs. Food. That was, like, 2008. Was that on TV? It was on TV, yeah. That was kind of like diners, drive-ins, and dives, right? Like, where he, like, goes yes. to the food competition restaurants, right? Yeah. He, like, travels around America and, like, goes to these small-town restaurants where they had a specific food challenge. Yeah. Like, eat this ginormous pizza or eat this, I don't know, 20-pound burger. And he would do the challenges. And you would watch. So, like, very similar content to mukbangs around the same time period slash even earlier. So I thought it was very surprising that this reporter was like, this is so foreign. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Americans love this stuff, too. There's this image that honestly lives rent free in my mind every time anyone talks about food competitions. I viscerally remember during Fourth of July, the hot dog eating contest, they mm -hmm. showed this clear plastic bag of what 82 hot dogs or however many it is that they eat looks like in the stomach all chewed up with however many cups of water that they drink oh and it's so big it's the size of a pillow <laughs> I'm like, and they're not allowed to throw up for 24 hours or they lose their title that just sits there and it has to digest i didn't realize they weren't allowed to throw up yeah you can't get sick wow what if it happens accidentally i guess it's part of like being an athlete quote unquote athlete in this space like yeah. you, you can hold it down <laughs> wow fascinating yeah i'm not surprised that there was the crossover appeal at all yeah in the documentary like they interviewed a fan who managed the fan club for one of the bjs his job was to monitor the forums and just make sure that no one was saying anything profane or mean about her like the bj and then like they had this one scene in the documentary where that person the fan group manager and like three other fans and they were all men and it was like a female BJ. And in the documentary, they actually met each other in person for the first time and had a meal together. Like they had KBBQ. And while they were having dinner, she was really nice. She like got them gifts. And it was like a very wholesome interaction. But the men were like also watching the stream, even though she was right there in front of them. They were also watching the stream of that current moment because she streamed their like restaurant eating experience. And they would rather watch it on the screen than in real life. Yeah, they were, like, eating, obviously, but they also had their phones. Almost like it was, like, a safety net, right? Yeah. Like, that's just what they were so used to is having her voice, having her eating noises, whatever, like, while they would eat. I was just about to say that it almost seems like a safety blanket in an awkward social situation for them rather than it being like, oh, I would rather watch it on the screen. It's like, no, this is just kind of awkward for me and maybe I'm introverted. Yeah, it's just interesting that it can become such a second nature thing that, yeah. like, okay, I'm getting my beer and I'm getting my napkins and I'm getting my chopsticks or whatever, but I'm also like putting on my person who's going to eat with me. Oh, that's interesting. I wasn't looking at it from that lens. Interesting. Yeah. 
So a lot of these stars feel genuine community with their fans. They're taking suggestions from their fans, like their fans are telling them to like wear something and they like wear something, or they're like responding to their chats live. So I thought that dynamic is really interesting. I don't know if that's like replicated today with YouTube because not all of that is live. And so then you're truly just talking to a camera. Like back in the day, it was these Korean live streamers. They had their camera recording them, but they were actually looking at a different computer screen that had all the messages coming in. Yeah, definitely very different when the YouTube era came about. Yeah. And so when this all came to YouTube, there had been, as I mentioned, Korean BJs also posting on YouTube for a while, but it really like blew up more in the mainstream and especially in American culture because of this reaction video that the Fine Bros posted. Do you remember them? I don't know. I like remember them because I actually like internet YouTube in 2014 and they were like really big stars. It's crazy because like all the stars back then, like, I mean, I guess a lot of time has passed. I'm much older now, too. But like a lot of them are not really on YouTube anymore. But the reaction video, I recognized all those people because they were all the big YouTubers of like nine years ago. (laughs) And now the channel has been rebranded to like it's called just like React. So it's just like a reaction video where they had all these YouTube stars watch Korean mukbangers. And yeah, I watched the whole video. It's like it gave me another one of those feelings where I was like, oh, wow, this content doesn't age that well when it's like nine years ago and everyone's like, oh, my God, this is such a weird thing. And I feel like the reality is is there's so many more weird things that have happened on the Internet (laughs) since then. So it feels kind of silly that they're like so weirded out by like people eating. Yeah, that that video is kind of like a seminal moment in mukbang culture. Because it's called YouTubers React to Mukbang Eating Shows. It went viral in 2015, and it was the moment that brought mukbangs to the Western mm-hmm. audience and kicked off the entire genre in America. So shortly after that video goes viral, Trisha Paytas releases her first mukbang. And this is really what kicks it all off. People loved that content. She was already popular, to be fair. But Trisha starts doing lots of mukbang content. And she had this quote that she told ABC News. She said, I think the most I ever made was when I did a Pizza Hut mukbang where I ate like five different pizzas and I made $50,000. What? In yeah. one video? In one video. Wow. Okay. Wait, this is like blowing those $9,000 we were talking about out of the water. Yeah. So Trisha starts making a ton of money. They get very popular. And there's kind of two intersecting reasons why this really pops off on YouTube. One of them is unlike the Korean streaming platforms that... You know, it's like the 10 cent balloon that goes right to the creator. YouTube promotes sensationalized content, A, and B, it works off of advertising and sponsorships. So what ended up happening is mukbang content was kind of provocative at the time. It was sensationalized because Trisha would eat, like I said, five pizzas in one video. YouTube loved this, promoted it. Fast food chains and other food companies noticed that this was getting popular, so they would start advertising specifically on food content, which further made YouTube promote that kind of content. And then those food companies would also sponsor videos with the YouTubers. And so there was money, there was content, it just blows up. Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Like just the structure of monetization between the platforms drastically changes the type of content that you get because in the more Asian iterations, it's more intimate with the audience. They're talking. I mean, yes, they're eating large quantities of food, but it gets kind of grotesque once you get into like the Western American, like post 2015 style content that is like incredibly sensationalized. And the YouTubers aren't on live stream, so they're not interacting directly with their audience, but they're talking about themselves personally. So they'll tell anecdotes if it's not an ASMR style video. And people start developing these really crazy parasocial relationships with these mukbangers. So today, food is actually YouTube's most popular content category. Wait, whoa, I had no idea. Yeah. And interestingly enough, 75% of adults and 94% of young adults in the United States spend up to three hours watching YouTube a week. YouTube, I believe, but I thought you were going to say watching mukbang content. No, I couldn't find any stats specifically on mukbang content. But even the fact that it's the largest content category and people spend that much time on YouTube, I'm like, it has to be quite a few hours. As the content gets more sensationalized, you start seeing people doing these crazy challenges like 10,000 calorie mukbangs and you get channels like Epic Mealtime. Did you ever watch Epic Mealtime? I did not, but I I think the guy who did Epic Mealtime was inspired off of Jackass and like those old shows and like even Man vs. Food. 
Yeah. So I feel like they were popular before 2015, weren't they? Yes. It was more okay. it was more like food content, but it's the precursor to all of that mukbang yeah. content. But it primed everyone to love watching enormous amounts of food being consumed. Like people just kind of like this content. And so the mukbangers would emulate that on their own. And Trisha also says that she did the 10,000 calorie challenge and she goes on to say, I felt like I had to redo it and do it right. So then I did the 20,000 calorie challenge and then I did the 100 nugget challenge. And you just feel so much pressure because you just want to keep one upping yourself. Does Trisha make only mukbang content now? No, she was like an OG YouTuber. So she's been around forever. That was just like part of the content that she morphed into. Yeah, it's interesting that even though she doesn't do that content full time, she still felt pressure to like keep one upping herself with the food challenges. Yeah, totally. I imagine if you're a content creator who you only do mukbang content, then yeah, how do you keep it interesting? Like at some point, you're going to run out of different foods to eat. So then you just have to eat them in larger quantities. I don't know. Well, Bethany Gaskin, B Loves Life on YouTube, the mother of the seafood boil mukbang, <laughs> she did a New York Times profile in 2019. And she said that she made over a million dollars a year on her YouTube yeah. channel, where she was just doing mukbangs of seafood boils specifically. I hadn't heard of her, but as I was doing research, I came across her name and I watched one of her videos. You did? Yeah, I did. I I still don't get it. But I mean, I guess she makes the food look really good if that's what you're into. So she does. She does. Yeah, I still, I still don't quite get it either, but we'll get into that. So there is one very famous American mukbanger that I want to mention, which is Nika Kato like Nico Avocado. He started off as a vegan YouTuber and he started doing mukbang content, rescinded his veganism, started eating grotesque amounts of food and became morbidly obese, gained 80 pounds in a matter of two and a half years doing mukbang content. Now, the 80 pound figure was cited back in 2019. So it's since gotten worse, but he is often cited when we start talking about the negative effects of mukbang content on both the creator and the viewer. One of the reasons I even wanted to talk about it this week is because Jellybean Sweets, a mukbanger on TikTok, has been the center of a lot of discourse over the past few weeks. She used to be a TikToker that did just dance content and then started doing mukbang content. Her original mukbangs were like just normal meals. They were Subway. She was eating slow. People enjoyed watching her methodically eat like a normal person. And then she started getting into the more sensationalized food mukbang content and stopped dancing and then people have been commenting about how unhealthy it is that she started eating this way and like how it just promotes binge eating online. People have a lot of thoughts about this. And what I thought was actually really interesting is she tends to eat the same meals over and over again, much like a lot of other TikTok mukbangers. You see all the time raising canes with the big jug of sauce in the fountain soda size cup. You obviously see crumble cookies like every single week and <laughs> tons of Chipotle and Wingstop. Yeah. But I wanted to see how much this viral content was affecting the sales of these companies. And interestingly enough, I thought this was absolutely wild. Wingstop in Q1 of 2024 reported a 36.8% growth in net sales compared to Q1 2023. And that's around the time this was trending. Like, this is what kicked it off. Yes. Okay. Did you look at if other fast food chains, like in the control group, saw similar increases? No, I did not. <laughs> so we don't know if it's just like people eating more fast food in general or if it's like Wingstop because it was trending on TikTok. Yes, that's true. But I would presume that increase is outside the norm. It seems like a lot. Crumble and Canes, I wasn't able to get numbers because they don't publicly report. Well, yeah. And I'm curious, like I, I haven't been as much in this world. When you're saying like all this discourse about Nico Avocado, about jelly bean sweets, what's the take? Like, what is the internet saying about them? They're saying like, oh, that's just like bad for your health. Is that the message? I see two sides of it. Sometimes I see the take, just leave them alone, particularly mm -hmm. jelly bean sweets, because she's a girl in her early 20s. And they're like, just leave her alone. She's doing her thing, whatever. Some people get really upset with jelly bean sweets content because they say it's feeder content. So there's this element of this girl being sexualized on the Internet and they're like, she doesn't mm -hmm. understand what she's doing. Like, she's not going to be happy with this when she gets older. And then, yeah, a lot of people having to take that. It just promotes really unhealthy eating habits and we shouldn't be sensationalizing this online. Like, we shouldn't be normalizing this kind of content, particularly when it comes to Nika Kato, because he has gained so much weight and he's not a beloved figure in the public eye anymore. He's had a lot of controversy with other YouTubers and is kind of a problematic guy. So people are more apt to be like, 
yeah, this is disgusting and this is terrible content. But the discourse really centers around especially the feeder content aspect of it and why it's women so often that are the ones doing the mukbangs. Uh huh. And like feeder content being like, oh, mukbangs, even though all they're doing is eating, the people watching are maybe seeing that as like sexual somehow or like they have a fetish for that. Yeah. So I don't know too much about this community, but I do know that the feeder fetish and feeder content is when men will actually pay for women's food and want to watch them eat. And they get, I don't know, like it's, it's like sexually gratifying for them to know that they're fattening up the woman. Oh, what? Yeah. Like livestock. What? Wait, isn't this Hansel and Gretel? What? This is like literally that. I didn't know this was a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. I actually, I mean, if we want to get into it, I, can, I have like some research on why that is. Yeah, I'm so curious. Okay. I was so confused by this too, but yeah. So yeah. it's the fetishization of eating habits of women. So the women in mukbangs and like people who are paying for these women to eat a bunch of food, it demonstrates an embarrassingly large appetite and usually that's something that a woman tries to hide. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's like a control thing, kind of. It's a control thing, but it also shows a level of intimacy that the woman is able mm -hmm. to eat this much food or that you're there watching her do something that's supposed to be kind of shameful and private. And that's erotic. And it also promotes the objectification of women's bodies. People feel ownership over the woman's body if they know that they are the ones that have made her fat. Interesting. Yeah, it's a very parasocial thing. It's kind of reminding me of even the roots of this, because when this all started in Korea, there were male BJs, there were female BJs. And one of the questions the reporter asked was, she was asking a female BJ, like, are all of your fans men? Like, what's the dynamic here? And her answer, she actually asked it to her fans as she was live streaming. Oh. And wow. the answer that her fans gave were like, no, it's gender nonspecific. But... I feel like what you're saying now is kind of also what that reporter was trying to get at, which is like, you can't help but wonder if there is something else underlying it, right? Because like, even if we like step away from just food culture and like, I mean, that's fascinating what you found on like actual desire to control like what women put inside their bodies, but even just female versus male influencers, period. We kind of talked about this in our male coded media episode a bit where it's like, sometimes you have women who put themselves online, like even us, like we're putting ourselves online, but like our audience is female majority of our listeners are female and we like it that way and we want to keep it that way but then you've got like women who i mean yes of course maybe they're posting a certain kind of content that's specifically designed to attract men but not always you know i feel like sometimes they're just like posting stuff about their hobbies and they attract a mostly male audience and i don't know i wonder if mukbang is like a type of content that like leans one way or the other maybe that type of content does attract more opposite gender it actually does there was a study Oh, okay. Lovely. Here you go. <laughs> Great lead in. Yeah. So there there was a study and the researchers came to the conclusion that it was actually thin and attractive women who had the most views and their viewers were mostly overweight men. So that is the most popular kind of content, <laughs> which is actually not theater content, interestingly enough. But yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I know. I don't know what to make of that. I didn't I didn't get any further insights. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's everything you can assume from that, either from the more innocent side, which is just like, OK, well, you know, they want someone to keep them company while they're eating. Like kind of the original genesis of this mukbang content or all the way to the really dastardly <laughs> dark stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, they did have some theories about why this was one of them being like a thin woman eating enormous amounts of food creates this sort of vulnerability in her that is erotic and that watching somebody eat and like listening to the sounds of it is kind of sexual for these men, especially when the woman is attractive. And it says that the mukbang videos frequently left the audience with a range of feelings such as yearning, disgust, pleasure, shame, envy, and desire. Whoa. Yeah. I feel like if you surveyed someone after watching porn, they would probably have those same feelings. That is so true. Right? Yeah, especially like the disgust, yearning. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Shame. Those Shame is an interesting one. Yeah. You are so right. Brilliant. Brilliant connection. I mean, as interesting as it is to try to imagine what's going on inside the heads of these men, obviously this is way bigger than just the fetish component because everybody seems to love this mukbang content. Especially with your mention of eating noises, that really makes me think of ASMR. Yeah, one of the first people to kind of mesh the ASMR and mukbang world was ASMR the Chew. 
and she mm-hmm. is an African-American woman who eats pickles while typing with long fingernails. And you've probably seen her content. She goes super viral, or at least she did back in the day. I loved watching her videos. She's so good at it. She just like eats a little pickle and then like chews in the microphone and types. Uh-huh. It's so nice. Yeah, I don't get ASMR. Like the tinglies. Never. I've never gotten it, no. Wow. You have? Mm-hmm. I was actually Googling before this if it's real. About if ASMR is real or if it was just like a cultural thing. Like if something is actually happening inside of people's brains who do feel it. And while scientists don't understand what causes ASMR, they have observed effects in the brain. So for people who experience ASMR, researchers found increased alpha wave activity, which is associated with meditative states and relaxation. There was a study in Frontiers in Psychology using the Big Five personality traits, which we also covered in a previous episode. But the study found that people who scored higher on openness and neuroticism are more likely to actually experience ASMR. Okay, check, check, check. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, it seems like it depends on your personality. And the advice, if you do want to experience it but you haven't yet, is that you should just try to be open to it and maybe you just haven't found your trigger yet. Like yours is this... Pickle lady. I like the mouth sounds, which is so controversial. A lot of people hate the mouth sounds. And I like when women with like long acrylic nails tap like vinyl and like latex and stuff. Love that. What's the mouth sounds? Are they eating or they're just whispering? No, they just kind of whisper like this. Or like going. Oh. (laughs) Yeah, but I, I haven't found mine. And I feel like that advice applies well to mukbang too. Like just be open to it. Because clearly a lot of people do like this content. Yeah, I think one of the major reasons that people love it is that it alleviates the feeling of loneliness while you're eating alone, which you had mentioned before. But I think it's really interesting, particularly in the context of the UK and the US. There was a study Mm -hmm. done that 15% of viewers haven't shared a meal with a member of their family in the preceding half year. So a lot of... Yeah, this study was talking a lot about how it's such an innately human thing to want to share a meal with another person. Like eating alone is actually against our nature and it promotes connectedness when we eat together. And in the U.S., the number of people that live alone has over 5 x since the 1960s. No, it doesn't obviously correlate specifically with the rise of mukbang content, but you can see how like, okay, we're all more lonely than ever. We all live alone and we just sometimes want to eat with somebody. And this is a really accessible way to do that. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because from an origins of mukbang perspective, I had always heard that, oh, it like originated in Asia and like that shouldn't be surprising because there's so many single people in Asia. And I mean, obviously this is Korea specific, but like also even in Japan, the reason 7-Eleven culture is so big there and like they serve delicious food actually at 7-Eleven is because there's so many single people and a lot of times they can't be bothered to like cook a big meal if they're just eating for one. And so they'll just go to a 7-Eleven and get their food. And I've heard that like as a cultural thing. But when I actually looked at the stats, I was like, oh, is it true that like in Korea, there's a lot more single people and actually 40 percent of households in Korea are single. But that is the same as so many other countries. Really? So it's like very similar to Sweden. The U.S. is at 30 percent, so slightly less, but still really high. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I feel like it's a common misconception, I guess. Like the reality is like a lot of people all over the world are alone. And so that also makes sense why this content has spread so quickly, because even that same need that it was created for in Korea to start, that also exists here. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with the type of mukbang content that gets so popular, like the most popular ones are not the ASMR kinds. They're the ones where people are chatting and telling you about their lives and you build this parasocial relationship. And like that story that you were telling about with those guys having their phones up while they were there eating with the mukbanger, people who love mukbangs tend to gravitate towards the same mukbangers and like, oh, I eat with Trisha every night or I eat with Mm -hmm. Stephanie Sue every night. It feels really similar to any other celeb fandom. Like, yeah, even like some of the Korean mukbangers, like one of them was saying she was originally just a vlogger and she would just vlog her life. And then one day she was just hungry. So she (laughs) ate in front of her audience. (laughs) What a way to stumble into that. (laughs) I know. Her audience was like, we love this content. Can you please do more? And then she became a full time mukbanger. So amazing. (laughs) Even the YouTubers react video. Like a lot of those YouTubers were gamers and they were like, this is really not that different than what we do, which is we just play video games, but we're having funny banter while we're playing video games. And people watch hours and hours of the content like PewDiePie, who was the number one YouTuber and all he does is play games. And like, you know, he makes jokes. But is that that different than just like eating a meal and chatting? 
Not no. really. Is it much different than us just researching and chatting? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it is. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully it is. Yeah, the other reason I've heard this being popular is like because you can like live vicariously through the person who's eating mm-hmm. is like another hypothesis. And I've heard that in context of people who are maybe on a diet themselves or who cannot get the food that the mukbanger is eating. And so then they're just watching someone else enjoy and that satisfies something within themselves. Yep. But I find that hard to believe because usually when I'm watching really good food content, it makes me want to eat. Right. (laughs) But maybe that's why they're eating to such a disgustingly large amount, because then maybe you're kind of like, I don't want to touch food after that. Like, I just watch this person eat 20,000 calories like I'm good. Yeah. No, that's so, so interesting that you say that, because that was one piece of discourse that I saw so much was It's a lot of people with eating disorders on both sides of the spectrum, either binge eating or restricting disorders that love watching this content because on the restricting end, people with EDs tend to watch it to feel full, like this satiety by proxy. And then the binge eaters watch it because it makes the food taste better when they eventually eat it themselves. So it's like you would order Wingstop and then like watch a Wingstop mukbang. Yeah. Which I thought was so fascinating. Like there was an entire research paper about this. That's so interesting. Yeah, the research paper itself said heightened pleasure is displayed by mukbangers while they eat the foods in the video, which can result in a decrease in the pleasure that is experienced by the viewers when eating the food in real life, which is the restricting part of it. Uh. This can contribute to eating disorders, and it can also have the opposite effect for some viewers who, when they eat the actual food, it actually increases the pleasure. Damn, I can't believe there's like scientific papers about this. There was one in 2023. I know there was only I'm like one. So surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They announced in 2022 that they were going to be doing this because it had gotten so popular, and it was wow. so heavily tied with like both psychology and eating disorders specifically. So that's how they got the funding to do this research. They talk about too how it promotes an unrealistic belief around food and eating because often it is these thin mukbangers eating mm-hmm. all of this food, and it creates this fantasy that you can eat enormous amounts of food, stay thin. And unfortunately, like they are attractive female hosts a lot of the time. So I think that is also like part of what feeds into the discourse that I see on TikTok specifically around this, because you see so many people saying like, well, this mukbanger so clearly just chews the food and spits it out. Like there's Mm. a bunch of cuts. This is so wasteful. This is promoting really horrible eating habits, even if she is eating it. There doesn't seem to be a way to win (laughs) when somebody wants to rail against the mukbang content. Yeah, it's also interesting that all of the food tends to be unhealthy food, like yeah. indulgent food. Always. Yeah, like the cups of ranch or whatever. And oh you don't God. see people like mukbanging salads. I've seen people drinking the raisin cane sauce out of yeah. the bone cup. It's yeah. disgusting. It does make me not want to eat it, though. That's like so true. It's I'm so on that true. Side yeah. Did you see the viral Dubai chocolate bar? Oh, wait. Yes. There's like stuff in it. It looked like bugs, but I don't think it was bugs. It's like crunchy, like little halva pieces or something. Exactly. It's pistachio with phyllo dough in it, I think. But yeah, I was like, that looks so good. And I would always want it at the beginning of the mukbang video. And then by the end of it, I could feel my stomach cramping up because I was like, I couldn't eat a whole bar of it. But these people are. That's making it gross to me. Yeah, it's so interesting that this mukbang content, I feel like, yes, as you just said, like it became really popular in 2015 in America. But now I feel like it's almost having like another wave. Like I feel like I've been seeing it a lot more now even. And it's interesting because also obviously right now we have Ozempic and like thin culture being back in the spotlight and like how with fashion trends, for some reason, also like female bodies are treated like fashion trends. And now like thin is in again or whatever the fuck. Yeah, Jesus. And so it's really interesting that you have on one side this joy in watching people like overeat, like eat excessive amounts. And then you also have so much other types of food content. Like we're just obsessed with food content in general, like what I eat in a day from these clean girl aesthetic women. And they're eating like Chobani or whatever and it's like they're not eating that many calories a day or even like the really fitness bro type guys measuring out their grams of chicken breast you know and you've got like both of those types of content that do really well Mm -hmm. yeah you really can run the gambit here like there's another content creator that's going viral for just posting about how she stays thin while at the office and just what you said she'll eat like a protein shake and some rice cakes and just be like this is how i stay skinny at the office and she's a rail And so that kind of content isn't positive either, but we just love watching what other people eat. We love watching the food content. And I think we're just so curious about how other people eat and live that this stuff just goes viral on every extreme of the spectrum. 
I mean, it's interesting that even people who are getting criticism for promoting the unhealthier aspects of this lifestyle, if anything, like, what do they say? Like, no, no news is bad news. No such thing as bad press. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it, it feels like it's gotten so much more popular now. And I don't know if that's because there's more dialogue about it. And so it's driving more views. Like, I didn't even know who Nico Avogadro was, you know, but now I do because of this. And even us, like, talking about this on our show, like, more people are going to, like, become aware and then get curious and, like, watch those channels. It's going to make them more money. And it just continues with the cycle. But I, I feel like there's going to be, like, some sort of capitalist underpinning to this, right? Because, like, right now, obviously, mukbangs themselves and the creators... Like, you did a great job outlining how the systems in which they're rewarded do affect their content and, like, the choices they make about their own bodies. But then I can't help but think about, well, what about the Chipotle Wingstop crumbles of the world? Yeah, maybe they didn't plan to become one of these trending foods. But now that they are, and I'm sure they know they are, are they going to create, like, what are they going to do? Are they going to put more money? Yeah, and I think I totally agree with you. I've been thinking about this a lot, or how... There's going to be so many more food joints that come out with foods specifically for the mukbang right. virality crowd. And there's a Chipotle and a Subway right next to each other. And I went to Chipotle the other day. I have to be like so shameful in admitting it was because I saw somebody eating a Chipotle mukbang and I really wanted it. So I definitely oh got Chipotle gosh. for dinner. It's definitely <laughs> working on you. It's working. OK, but anyway, there's there's a Subway next to the Chipotle and they were advertising a foot long cookie now. And I'm like, this is so for the mukbang crowd. Like, they want that to go viral. That's all that is. Yeah. It's not real food. Yeah. Or like chicken fries. Yeah. <laughs> These like weird foods. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's interesting. If anything, it's crazy because like in the 2004 Super Size Me days, I feel like it was such a shaming culture against these big corporations for making their food so unhealthy and so caloric. And then all that legislation passed that said you literally have to post your calories next to your food in an effort to, like, help educate people. And now, you know, you literally have celebrities or, like, these YouTube stars seeking out to, like, eat the most amount of calories possible. It used to be, like, 10, 15 years ago. It was like, no, like, corporations are forcing us to do this. And now it's like, well, we're choosing to do it <laughs> ourselves. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what it is about watching, like thin attractive people eat like that that we love like if it just seems indulgent or if there's something about the psychology of like this thin attractive person doesn't have to try to be thin it's effortless as evidenced by them eating 5,000 calories in this one sitting but then if you watch them long enough they are gonna get big a lot of them don't though I really don't understand that but I don't I don't know what's happening there I think they're spitting it out. They have to be yeah, spitting it out. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a few on TikTok that are accused of spitting it out because they're like, you've been doing this for three years and you're still very thin. I don't understand how someone like, obviously there's competitive eating and like there's all the jokes that it's not really a sport, but like people who are competitive eaters like actually do have to train. It's not like anybody could just go eat 50 hot dogs, right? Like they're fasting before they eat. They're, yeah. I mean, sometimes they do dangerous things like you can like stretch your belly, which is when you just drink a lot of water to like stretch it out so that when you're filling with food, it can like grow bigger. Or um, eat a ton of grapes or like water heavy. Yeah, food. just like various things. So it's fascinating to me. Like, I mean, obviously people who are doing those competitive eating challenges, they are training to do that. Mm -hmm. But then you've got like, quote unquote, normal people eating normal sized food in general, suddenly becoming mukbangers. Like, how is Trisha Paytas eating 20,000 calories? Like, she's not a competitive eater. Like, how is she even doing that? That seems like insane. I know. That is such a good point. I don't know. It seems kind of fun. I would like to try it one time. I think I'm hungry. I think I need to go eat. The fact After that I'm like... cookies? Yeah, you've only had sugar. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm having like that dip at the blood sugar level. And I'm like, damn, 20,000 calories, five pizzas. That actually sounds real good right now. I think I could do that. <laughs> time to go watch some mukbang content about it and then and then decide. Yeah, I'll, I'll, really yeah, I'll decide it. what I want for lunch after I watch the mukbang content. <laughs> yeah. Maybe go to Chipotle after this. Hopefully we get a lot of good feedback on our personal mukbang moment. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Go easy on us, guys. All right. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. If you enjoy the pod, we would love for you to give us a follow and rate us on Apple Podcasts, which helps us get the word out and reach new listeners. Full transcripts and show notes are available on Patreon where if you choose to become a patron, you'll also get access to bonus content, our monthly book club, and our eternal gratitude. 
If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a topic for a future episode, email us at everythingiknowaboutpod at gmail.com or DM us across all socials at ecapod, that's E-I-K-A pod. Thanks for listening and see you next week. Thank you.